Just so you know, you're in the right talk. <laughs> okay. Step with me into a time machine. Uh, let's define a time machine as a contraption that can take you to any event in space-time. And uh, in this case, it's uh, 44 years ago, almost to the day, and just about 300 kilometers north of here. The day is October 10th, 1975. And uh, on this day, it's a Friday in autumn. A young doctor who is fresh out of medical school is on shift in the emergencies and accidents ward in a small Swedish coastal town of about 35,000 people. Uh, it's been a very calm morning, and uh, it is now lunchtime, and most of the senior personnel, the other doctors and nurses, are down in the hospital cafeteria for lunch, and everything looks and feels very routine. Not much going on. Until suddenly, the phone rings. Uh, the, the, f the hospital is being advised by emergency responders that a plane crash has occurred in the immediate vicinity and that the hospital is imminently to receive the first casualties by helicopter. And as soon as the young doctor hangs up, he grabs a nurse and they ran, run over to the shelf with the binders containing the emergency procedures because, of course, there's a lot of things that now need to happen in a very short time frame. They have to uh, prepare the ER for a mass casualty contingency, so set up triage procedures. They have to, uh, they're going to have to clear the hospital parking lot from all non-essential vehicles. They're going to have to uh, call in personnel that's on call, etc. But their frantic preparation is cut short when they already hear the chopper land on the hospital's helipad and seconds later the first patient is wheeled through the ER doors on a stretcher. And the doctor immediately starts evaluating this patient. Uh, he is conscious and he is breathing, but otherwise he is not in very good shape. Uh, he is shaking violently, he is incoherent, he can't verbally respond, and uh, all that he manages to utter is a sound that goes like that's all he can get out. And the doctor, of course, immediately recognizes this as symptoms consistent with cerebral trauma. So evidently, this person, this patient, has had a head injury and might lose consciousness any moment. And as he's examined the patient, uh, the doctor has removed uh, the patient's rescue jacket. Apparently, this was a plane crash into water. Drops that on the floor. And what he sees now is uh, a military flight suit that the patient is wearing. So evidently, he's dealing with a fighter or bomber pilot. And suddenly, the penny drops for the doctor that the zhuzh sound that the pilot was making might have been an attempt to speak Russian. And in an, in, in an example of remarkable acuity on the young doctor's part, the doctor speaks a little bit of Russian. Uh, he's taken a bit of Russian at university. And so to reassure the patient that he's going to be all right, he says, I'm a doctor, you're in a Swedish hospital. And at this, the patient's, the pilot's eyes just widen in horror like that, right? His eyes get wide in horror. Uh, he's still not responding. To, to the doctor, the picture is very, very clear. He's dealing with a Soviet pilot uh, who's been shot down or otherwise downed over hostile territory, which is something that the pilot is obviously terrified about. And he, that is the doctor, comes to a dismal conclusion, right? Because if we're shooting down Soviet jets, then that probably means that we're at war with the Soviet Union. And if we're at war with the Soviet Union, that in turn means we're probably in the opening minutes of World War III, right? Because this is 1975. But the doctor quickly realizes that he has a much more urgent problem on his hands. Uh, he looks down, and he realizes that he's standing in a red puddle. So this patient evidently doesn't just suffer from head trauma. He doesn't just have a brain injury. But he also has an open wound possibly an arterial bleeding, that they haven't found yet. They just don't know where this wound is. So what they need to do is they need to get his flight suit off of him as soon as possible. And unfortunately, the doctor isn't very accustomed to patients wearing military flight suits, and so he's running into a bit of a snag. He simply can't find the right zippers or buckles to get the damn suit off the pilot. And whatever he tries, all he manages to open is one. Of, all he manages to get open is actually one of the many pockets that the suit has, which doesn't help a lot. 
And now this is all happening in a very, very compressed time frame. It's something like 90 seconds after the original call. And now the senior, the senior doctors and nurses finally pour in from wherever they were having their lunch break. And just as, about, as he's about to cut into the flight suit trousers uh, with the scissors, a nurse stops him and says, hey, don't do that. That's an anti-G suit. Those are thousands of kroner apiece. Which is 1975 kroner, so you have to multiply by about 5.7 to account for inflation. Um, and the doctor looks at her just momentarily befuddled, as in like, that's your problem? Right? Uh, and to which the nurse adds, uh, oh, and you may want to step off his rescue jacket because it looks like you popped a sea dye marker cartridge and you're making a mess all over the floor. <laughs> After which she, of course, expertly strips the patient of his flight suit and the evaluation of uh, this patient continues. A patient who, it turns out, is a Swedish Air Force pilot who was forced to eject from his Saab HA-37 vegan strike fighter, tail number 37005. Uh, he'd been on a routine training flight over the Baltic Sea uh, and then lost control of his plane due to a structural failure, a wing fracture, was, which was a problem that was plaguing the airframe in the mid-70s. And he was pulled out of the approximately eight degree water by a search and rescue team, which then flew him promptly to the nearest hospital because he was suffering from a rather bad case of hypothermia, the symptoms of which include incoherence and slurred speech and violent shivers. And the reason I'm telling you all this is that absolutely every single assumption that the doctor was making in this incident was wrong, with one exception. There was actually a plane crash. It involved a single-seat military aircraft, not a commercial airliner. Therefore, mass casualty treatment was never required. They were dealing with a single patient all along. The patient wasn't suffering from cerebral trauma, but from hypothermia. The patient wasn't trying to speak Russian. He simply couldn't get any coherent words out, again, due to his hypothermia. And the patient wasn't suffering from sudden catastrophic bleeding. Instead, the red puddle came from a fluorescent sea dye marker cartridge. And those happen to be bright green when they're dissolved, but they look like really blood red when they're concentrated. And of course, Sweden was not at war with the Soviet Union, and nuclear Armageddon wasn't imminent. And thankfully for the doctor, uh, none of the decisions that he made based on these wildly inaccurate assumptions actually harmed anyone. Um, and there were no further injuries, uh, other than, of course, probably scaring the living daylights out of Swedish Air Force Reserve. That's, that's okay. That's okay. Um, uh, scaring the living daylights out of a Swedish Air Force Reserve lieutenant named Harald Gottel who presumably was already having the worst day of his flying career, only to then come to, to the terrifying realization that rather than being pulled out of the Baltic Sea by Swedish Navy comrades, he was presumably snatched and then abducted by a team of Spitsnaz who then speared them away to somewhere where the hospital doctors only spoke Russian. And he reflected later in life that he was actually quite thankful for this rather inconsequential mishap early in his career because it profoundly and permanently influenced his later thinking, which was uh, to always challenge your own assumptions. And the young doctor with this approach incidentally became a very famous man. Uh, in the early 1980s, he discovered a working prevention mechanism for bound legs disease, or CONZO, while on a Doctors Without Borders mission in uh, Mozambique. Uh, he, became, uh, the, uh, he became a professor of international health here at Karolinska Institute in 1995, and in the early 2000s uh, kind of rose to internet fame with his data visualizations and riveting commentary on public health issues. And of course, uh, we lost him much too soon in 2017. His name is Hans Rusling. And what we should do is we totally should take Hans's advice and apply to op operating and running OpenStack, which is to always challenge our own assumptions. And that's what the rest of this talk is about. And for those of you uh, who are not native speakers of English, who are maybe not familiar with the idiom, uh, what's a red herring? I'm not talking about this sort of red herring. Um, a red herring is something that misleads or distracts from a relevant or important question. In other words, among other things, a red herring can be the apparently obvious cause of a problem, whereas a real cause is non-obvious and in reality completely different. And uh, let's start out with something relatively straightforward, uh, virtual routers in Neutron. So let's see if this demo here works. It should, I hope. 
And what I'm doing here is I'm simply creating virtual routers in a loop, right? I'm operating against a single tenant, and I just add one virtual router after another. And all of that seems to work just dandy, right? You see there's more routers that are coming up, going to status active, and then suddenly it stops working. Suddenly all my routers go to status error. And any more routers that I add to this um, still run into this error state. Weird. So let's see what's at fault here. Let's start with the obvious one, with the obvious assumption, which is um, I might be dealing with a quota issue. Yeah, exactly. Congratulations, you just identified a Soviet pilot. So let's suppose I'm running into an administrator-imposed limit, uh, and providers, of course, can set these limits through the OpenStack quota system. So let's check whether perhaps I'm running into a quota limit. I can always check what my quota is with OpenStack quota show. But what I get back from here uh, when I run this is, no, I can actually create up to 500 routers. So no, it's definitely not a quota issue. And besides, if I actually exceed a quota, what I ought to be getting back from uh, Neutron is an HTTP 413 rather than the HTTP 200 combined with a router error that I'm getting here. So that's weird. Uh, and we can dig into other things, like maybe Neutron has a hard configuration limit that is sort of outside of the quota system, like Heat has for stacks. You may or may not know that in Heat there is a configuration file determined limitation on by default 100 stacks per tenant, which you can up, you can change that, but it's a provider side setting that you can change. It doesn't go through the quota system. So no, that doesn't get us anywhere either. So let's see. Let's try a thing uh, just by way of experimentation. Let's try and create a router that's got HA disabled. Let's see what happens there. Okay, OpenStack router create, no HA. And then finally, that works, right? So without HA, I can get another router. Uh, but with HA, I can't. Ha. Huh. Okay. So what about HA routers? How do those work, really? This is something that goes back all the way to the OpenStack Juno release. Uh, and back then, we got high availability support in Neutron routers. Which means that, assuming that you have more than one network gateway node to host them on, your virtual routers will be deployed in an automatic active backup configuration. In effect, what Neutron does for you is that for every subnet that uh, is plugged into the router and for which it therefore acts as the default gateway, the gateway address binds to a VRP interface that is backed by KeepAliveD. And on one of those network nodes, the interface is active, and on the others, it's in standby. And if your network node goes down, KeepAliveD then makes sure that the subnet's default gateway IP comes up on the other node. And all that keep alive D configuration is completely abstracted away from you. The Neutron L3 agent happily takes care of all of that. You don't need to do anything. But in order to do that, what Neutron does, is it creates one administrative network per tenant over which it runs the VRP management traffic. So the things that the two keep alive D instances need to talk to each other. And in order to tell apart all the keep alive D instances that it manages on that administrative network, it assigns each individual um, VRP interface, a virtual router ID, or VRID. And here's the problem. This is all defined in RFC 5798, and that RFC defines the VRID to be an 8-bit integer. It's the virtual router ID bit that you can see there in the second row. And so that means um, you cannot ever have more than 255 VRP addresses on the same network. And that, in turn, means that because we have one such network per tenant, setting a router quota over 255 is completely useless, because Neutron will run out of VRIDs in the administrative network before your tenant can ever hit that quota. 
And this is a hard limit. There's not really a whole lot that Neutron can do about this apart from changing its implementation to spin up ad additional administrative networks once it runs out of VRIDs in the first one. Uh, but that is likely to be a pretty involved change. So therefore, at least for the time being, if you do want more than 255 highly available routers, and in many OpenStack environments, routers are HA by default, if you want more than 255 such routers per tenant, then uh, then you're out of luck. So if you need more than 255 total, you're going to have to spread them across multiple tenants. You may ask, well, what if I don't really need my HA, my routers to be HA? Firstly, probably you really do. But with that aside, if we can assume for a moment that you actually don't, uh, or rather it's more important for you that you get 200, more than 255 routers in a single tenant rather than that all your tenants are HA, uh, you can create routers with that HA flag set to false, or so you think. Because it turns out that most probably you're not going to be able to do that because of a default neutron policy that looks like this. Okay, a default neutron configuration looks such that the HA flag, setting it and reading it, is an admin only operation. And if you want to allow non HA routers in your environment, you have to change this and instead set them like this, where you set, um, you switch that rule to that flag being available to not just the admin, but the admin or the owner of that router. In case you're curious, if, you, if you're deploying your OpenStack with OpenStack Ansible, you can define this neutron policy overrides that has exactly that effect. And once the policy has been overridden in this manner, then you should be able to create a new router with, as I showed before, OpenStack router create, no HA. And you can also flip that or toggle that HA flag for an existing router, and you do that like this. You can't set the flag on an active router, but you have to disable it very. Uh, you have to disable it temporarily, uh, then set the HA flag um, to no HA for your router, and then you can re-enable it. Okay. So first red herring. My second one is from Magnum. In Magnum, your pre, there's basically three prerequisites, or th three things that you need to do in order to run a Kubernetes cluster. Uh, you're going to have to have an image in Glance for one of the operating system platforms that Kubernetes support supports. Uh, or I'm sorry, that Magnum supports for Kubernetes, let's put it that way. And there are several of those. But at least presently, Fedora Atomic or Fedora, Fedora Atomic Host is the best tested and the most widely used. So that's what you would normally default to. Secondly, you need a Magnum uh, cluster template that references that image. And then finally, you can actually use that template to spin up the cluster. OK, let's look at that. So here I have an image, uh, which happens to be, what are you going to see in a moment? There we go. I have, an, I have a Fedora Atomic 27 image, which should totally be supported to deploy Kubernetes 115.3 with Magnum. And this is my cluster template definition which uh, sets the cluster orchestration engine to Kubernetes, sets the kube tag label to 115.3, which means that Magnum is going to install that Kubernetes release. OK, that's my template. And now I can use that template to fire up a cluster. OK. And that returns an HTTP 200. Request to create cluster has been accepted. Wonderful. Right? And then it takes a few minutes, and then I have my my Kubernetes cluster available. But suppose I really don't want to use Fedora Atomic 27 because it's kind of outdated at this point, and I want to go, you know, as long as Fedora Core S30 is not out yet, I want to use Fedora Atomic Host 29 instead, which is the latest available Fedora Atomic Host release that I can use here. Okay, now to do that, in this case, I've uploaded a Fedora Atomic 29 image. There we go. And again, deploying Kubernetes off of this should totally work. So creating a template from this image should work, and then I should also be able to spin up a cluster. So let's see what happens here. It's basically exactly the same thing as I did before. So if I do that, then I'm getting 
a nondescript HTTP 400 error. Right? So HTTP 400 is bad request. That's all that defines HTTP 400, which means that something is obviously wrong with my API call, right? I'm obviously making a wrong API call, and since I've been making all my API calls exactly by the book and exactly by the documentation, the first problem to assume would be, okay, well, this has got to be a bug in either the Python Magnum client library or the OpenStack client, right? Because how else would I be able to make like a wrong or an incorrect API call using the standard CLI tools? So clearly a bug, right? No. Oh another red herring because it turns out that the actual culprit is a missing property on the image and that property is OS distro and it has to be set to Fedora atomic it has to be actually all lowercase Fedora hyphen atomic otherwise the Magnum uh, Kubernetes Fedora atomic driver will just refuse to use it um, giving this weird error which is actually documented. You can totally read this up in the, in the Magnum documentation, but many Magnum users will never need a private image, and they will instead rely on an image that is available through their cloud service provider. Uh, but when you do, when you upload your own image, you forget to set this property, then uh, you get a rather unhelpful error message, and that frequently trips you up. And once we set this template, then we can totally create our cluster template, and once we've got the the um, template, then we can fire up a new cluster, and that fires up Kubernetes 115.3 on Fedora Atomic Host 29, just dandy. There's literally nothing else you need to do. Uh, you, and six minutes later, eight minutes later, you've got your Kubernetes cluster, and off you go. But not going to work without that specific property. And my third and last example, red herring for you, uh, comes from heat. has to do with heat templates. So what I'm doing next here is I fire up a heat template, or I try creating a stack from a heat template, and I get a rather nondescript HTTP 500, which isn't telling me much, but I can add debug, and then I find out, oh, wait, this is actually a Unicode decode error. Right? So in other words, the heat API endpoint, not the client, is complaining that it's been given a template with an invalid encoding which also sounds awfully buggy because if it was actually an incorrectly encoded template, it's the heat client that should actually catch that. Um, and um, the additional information, by the way, that we're getting here out of the debug output is pretty useless. It, it actually does complain. I get a stack trace and it, I, I get an exact character that heat is complaining about, but that's actually a US ASCII character. So it's not even a double byte character. Clearly, that is not something that would trigger a UTF-8 decoding error. So the additional information that we're getting there is pretty useless. And you should know, and that's kind of the funny part about this, is um, I ran into this specific issue um, basically suddenly without making any changes to my template, which, is, which had previously worked quite all right. And the only thing that had changed in the interim when I first saw this problem was that the OpenStack region that I was running against had just been upgraded from Okada to Pike. And I did have another Okada region available, and the, there the template ran perfectly fine, and had other Pike and later regions where the template broke. Weird. Right? So surely this is obviously a regression that happened somewhere between Okada and Pike that somehow slipped past all the gates and CI checks and, and whatnot, right? And I can tell you I spent rather significant time working this one out, uh, but in the end the alleged encoding problem turned out to be yet another red herring. And uh, here's what's actually happening. Uh, you may recall that in heat templates, we have intrinsic functions that we can use in them, and one of them is the string replace function, or str replace for string templating. And here's an example. Uh, so in this example that you see here, there's a string host in the template parameter of the str replace function, and it is replaced with the IP address of a Nova instance, which then results in a usable URL uh, as an output that I can then retrieve with OpenStack stack output show login URL. It's all fairly straightforward. 
And of course, apart from get atra, which is used here, you can, of course, also use other functions. You could use get param to reference a stack parameter. You could get, get resource to use another stack's resource, UUID, etc. But the interesting part here is what happens is the parameter substitution that happens is just a simple string replacement. And that means you can name your parameters anything and you're not required to use any variable marker prefix, like the dollar sign, for example, is in bash. Um, but if you're not using any such prefix, then that quickly makes the templates very unreadable because you can't really tell visually which of these are string literals and which of these are variables that get replaced. So most people do use some sort of prefix, although there's really not much of a convention there. Uh, so some people do this, which is just using dollar signs as they would in a bash script. Uh, some people, frequently the people that come from a background of say JSP or ASP.NET, um, frequently use some variation of uh, angle brackets and percent. Some people just use caps, right? You can just use capitals if you want to. It's essentially completely up to you. The documentation also doesn't mandate anything or doesn't recommend anything. As long as it's valid YAML, um, then you're fine. And I'm going to show you a code snippet on one of my templates that used to run perfectly fine in all OpenStack releases up and including Akata, uh, which is this. Uh, it simply takes a stack parameter named Ubuntu Mirror and then it uh, injects that into an instance's configuration via a cloud config resource. I'm sorry, that kind of gets squished a little bit. But basically what it does, it injects this into cloud config so that depending on which OpenStack region I launch in, I can select a mirror, an Ubuntu mirror that's relatively close by where I have good bandwidth and, and low latency too. And as I said, this particular template worked perfectly fine up until Locata, and as soon as you fired it up in any later release, you got a 500. And now you may say, of course, ha, clearly what's happening here is uh, it's trying to parse the string open brace mirror close brace as an intrinsic function, which doesn't exist, right? Which would be a clever objection. Uh, but I have two answers for you on that, which is one, masking an unknown function name behind Unicode decode error would be pretty silly. Uh, and secondly, if you do use proper quoting for this template string, you see exactly the same problem. So that's not the issue. And in reality, this is all it takes. If you, if you swap out uh, the uh, open brace and close brace uh, prefix and suffix, and you replace that with a percent prefix, you're fine. And that did the trick. And then you can simply uh, take this thing and uh, make that little change, fire it up, and off you go, right? Sorry about the weird control characters here. But you see the point. We're fixing that up. We're firing up the stack. And now that also works in Pike and all later open stack releases. The stack just spins up, goes to create in progress. And that's it. If you'd like uh, the slides for this talk, um, they're right here. They're up on GitHub. Uh, I do want to uh, give proper image credits. And that concludes my talk. And I will now be looking Do we have any questions on the Twitters. Okay, no questions. There was a few comments. Thank you for those, but no questions on the Twitter. Does anyone here still have questions? Because we do have a couple of minutes to go. No? Okay. Well, then I thank you for your time, and I wish you a great rest of the afternoon. Thank you.